The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. If Vladimir Putin thought Russia could march right into Ukraine and take charge, he apparently was sorely mistaken. As we approach the one-month anniversary since the war began, we ask, is this headed for a bloody stalemate or a settlement that could end the bloodshed? Then, cyber attacks could have hit Ukraine hard. Why didn't Russia take that approach? And could it be the next front in the war? We'll assess that. It's Wednesday, March 23rd, and that's next on The Agenda. The imbalance between Russia and Ukraine in military terms was glaring from the moment the war began. And yet, as days turn into weeks in this conflict, it's Ukraine's fierce resistance that's bogged down the former superpower and made it a real fight. With us now on How Things Stand, let's welcome, in America's capital city, Angela Stent, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and author of Putin's World, Russia Against the West and With the Rest. In our nation's capital, Jeff Sahadeo, professor at Carleton University's Institute of European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies, and the author of Voices from the Soviet Edge, Southern Migrants in Leningrad and Moscow. And in the annex of our provincial capital, Janice Stein, the Bellsburg Professor of Conflict Management in the Department of Political Science, former founding director of the U of T's Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. And we're uh, very pleased to have you three back on our airwaves tonight. I want to just set up our conversation by getting the following on the record here. The invasion has driven 10 million people, nearly a quarter of Ukraine's population, from their homes, that according to the United Nations. The Washington Post reported over the weekend that Russia's attempt to conquer Ukraine could be headed toward a stalemate as heavy casualties and equipment losses take a toll on unprepared Russian forces. And President Joe Biden said on Monday that Ukrainians are, quote, wreaking havoc against the Russian military. All right, let's get into this. Angela, what's your sense of where things are at as we speak in terms of Russia's attempt to win this war in Ukraine? Well, the Russians grossly miscalculated when they invaded because they thought this was apparently going to be over in 72 hours and the Ukrainians would surrender. So it is a stalemate. Uh, the Ukrainians are fighting back very valiantly and they're fighting for a cause. Whereas I think the Russians don't really know why they're fighting this, particularly the young conscripts who apparently were not prepared for this because the, everyone thought the war would be over again in 72 hours. Uh, this could go on for a very long time. Obviously, devastating consequences for Ukraine itself. The city uh, more or less starved out and lying in ruins. Other Ukrainian cities with heavy bombardments, as you say, a terrible humanitarian catastrophe. Uh, but the Ukrainians aren't giving up. Uh, and President Biden is going to Europe this week, uh, meeting with NATO allies in the European Union and the G7. And I'm sure they're going to be discussing more ways in which they can help Ukraine. Jeff, are you similarly confident this is headed towards stalemate? Yes, I'd agree with everything that Angela said. And obviously, it's a stalemate until it's not. Uh, I would certainly agree that the Russian forces, the conscript forces, are, are having trouble grasping why they're in Ukraine. <clears throat> but the Russian public is solidly behind this. And uh, for Putin, this is an existential uh, exhibit of what the Russian state can do. So he can't afford to lose this war. And he'll keep pouring in resources. The Russians still have access to anything from a lot, many more aircraft to to hypersonic weapons to chemical to biological to nuclear that they have in their arsenal um, they can't afford to lose this war at the same time as angela said the ukrainians are fighting for a cause zelensky has rallied the uh, the troops has rallied the population uh, and it's very difficult to see how russia has the actual human forces perhaps to to win the war in the short term but certainly not to either occupy ukraine or to turn it towards the kremlin which has always been its goal in the long term so we are heading towards as angela said a very long conflict potentially and we look at maybe soviet afghanistan the invasion the invasion as an example where that dragged on for years until forces and, and countries eventually get exhausted of the war and we're not near that point yet uh, quick follow-up here. You say the Russian people are clearly on side with this war. How do you know that? 
Well, I mean, not only do we have opinion polling and also opinion polling from actually fairly reliable um, sources, uh, and the sense that Ukraine has always been part of the Russian territory, um, as, you, as the Russians have been taught, right, not necessarily the reality. Uh, it's, not so, it's partly a combination of propaganda and the sense among Russians that Russia deserves to be a great power. So it's not clear how long this support would last or how deep it is. Uh, but Putin, in the 20 years that he's managed to rule Ukraine, um, has had the population solidly on side with the goal of Russia being a great power. And the problem with things like sanctions from the West, even though I, I think that this is something we need to do, is it enforces Putin's narrative of the West against Russia. And I think that becomes a problem. Now, once these soldiers and these conscripts start to come back more and more in body bags and stories come out of Putin's leaving soldiers behind, for example, this could wane, but we're definitely not at that point yet. Uh, Janice, uh, as Angela has said, uh, Russia thought this war was going to be over pretty quickly, and it's pretty obvious it's not going to be over pretty quickly. Was there, as you look back at the past month, was there an apparent turning point in which everybody came to realize Oh my goodness, this is not going to take 72 hours. This is going to take a lot longer. I, I think there certainly was, and it was probably the easiest way to convey that was that infamous convoy um, that rolled down the highways toward Kiev and then it was stalled and stalled and stalled. There's an old military expression, Steve logistics eat strategy every day for lunch. And that is a big part of what is bedeviling the Russians. Their logistics are terrible, is the only way to describe this. But when we talk about a stalemate, which I think is accurate, but only up to a point, let's just remember there is asymmetrical damage being inflicted here. Yes, Russians are losing soldiers anywhere up to 7,000, which is you know just an unbelievably high number for a month. Uh, it's important to recognize this, but Ukrainian cities are being devastated. It's not only Mariupol, it's many of them. And Russia retains the capacity to bomb and to use cruise missiles and to use artillery fire. Uh, that does not take away from how bravely the Ukrainians are fighting, but we have to be careful. There is a limited capacity. Any society has that to sustain this kind of horrific damage on its civilian infrastructure. So stalemate doesn't quite capture these asymmetrical dynamics. Understood. Angela, it seemed clear that the original attempt by Vladimir Putin was to have regime change in Kiev and essentially demilitarize Ukraine. Neither of those things has happened yet. Do you think that's still the plan for Russia? Um, before I get into that, let me just say the Russian population supports this war because they don't really know what's going on, uh, particularly if they just have access to state-run media. You know, they're told that this is a special military operation to denazify Ukraine and that Ukraine and NATO were threatening Russia with invasion. Uh, you know, if they knew more about what was really happening, I'm not quite sure that the support would be that great. And just to reiterate again, uh, a lot of the body bags are not coming back because they're not sending them back to Russia. They're keeping them in Belarus. Uh, and there are reports of that, uh, you know, about that today. Um, so I think on the regime change, uh, Putin has more or less given up on that. I think they've realized that, you know, Zelensky is popular, uh, that if they do want to negotiate with anyone, and maybe we'll come onto that later, Zelensky is the person they're going to have to negotiate with. Apparently, in the beginning, they did try uh, to put someone else in power, and then they realized it was impossible, and that if they were to have a puppet government, they would have to occupy Ukraine going forward, because the minute Russian troops withdraw, uh, then that puppet government would fall. And uh, my colleagues who are experts on these military uh, matters say it would take about 800,000 Russian troops to occupy Ukraine, uh, you know, for a long time, and they just don't have the resources to do that. The demilitarization, I think they also realize is going to be more difficult. I mean, they, of course, they have knocked out uh, quite a lot of the of Ukraine's own military equipment, and obviously uh, Ukrainian soldiers have died too. Uh, but because the West is supplying Ukraine and will continue to do so, it would be difficult to do that. Uh, so their, their aims, I think, have become somewhat more 
you know, realistic as this war has gone on. Uh, but it's still Putin's goal to subjugate Ukraine if he could. Uh, and obviously, Russia does have superior military power to the Ukrainians, undoubtedly. Uh, and it's also by now more or less cut off Ukraine from the Black Sea. Uh, it's really, in effect now, Ukraine is a landlocked country as it stands at the moment. So of course, the Russians could in the long run prevail, but then at what cost, uh, both domestically in Russia um, and in terms of you know, future sanctions? Dennis, I do want to pick up on that asymmetrical warfare that you just talked about a moment ago. And to that end, I'm going to ask our director, Sheldon Osmond, whom you know, to bring up a map of Ukraine right now so we can essentially, uh, for those watching on television, can see the state of play. And for those who are listening on podcast right now, let me just point out Mariupol, which you have heard so much about uh, in recent days in the southwest, uh, southeastern excuse me, part of the country, um, surrounded by Russian forces. President Zelensky has said it has been reduced to ashes. Janice, I wonder if you could tell us what you think if the Russians were able to completely capture that city, never mind destroy it, but capture and hold it, what that would mean in terms of their war effort. Well, this, the reason they have inflicted so much damage on Mariupol, Steve, is because as you saw on the map, uh, a key goal for Putin is uh, a land bridge for Crimea, and all along that southern coast. Let's and, bring the map up again so we, we can see actually what you're describing. Okay, tell now, us where Crimea is on this map and how it all works Crimea, into this. Crimea is the shaded area that Russia occupied um, in 2014, long before this war, war has started. Look how strategically Mariupol is located there. Seizing that city gives Russia direct access on land to the Crimea. There is no more core objective um, than that for Vladimir Putin. And that's why this horrific damage. And also, as Angela said, if you keep going, um, effectively, this will cut Ukraine off from the Black Sea and cut off its ability to export uh, wheat and all the other commodities. Uh, it will become a landlocked country. So just that area alone is, is the minimal criteria that Vladimir Putin and, and his generals have for this operation. And that's why it's taking this inhuman punishment that it's taken. Jeff, does that argue, given that scenario Janice just described, does that argue that the focus of Western uh, attention and contribution to Ukraine right now should be somehow to help out in that part of the country? Well, there are all these different strategic decisions, none of which come without risk. Uh, Mariupol, as, as Janice noted, is critical. It's been bombed. There, there's not a lot there yet. And, and one of the mistakes that the Russians has, has, have made is that they're trying to advance among different fronts simultaneously. So they're trying to move towards Kiev. They're trying to move in from the north and, and then trying to move into the south. So the NATO has uh, a decision to make. The West has a decision to make on where to help the Ukrainians. And without enforcing a no-fly zone, which is another debate that we could have, uh, really they're limited to giving arms, military weapons to Ukrainians and hopefully letting them decide where the Ukrainian army is best to fight. I think probably um, Kiev is a bigger prize than, than Mariupol at the, at the same time. It's where uh, still the, the Ukrainians are having some success, so maybe you're better off to put weapons there um, and help uh, the situation around Kiev, because that's where Zelensky is, after all. That's where the center of resistance is. Not to give up Mariupol, but there are some strategic decisions that have to be made. Also, that there are Ukrainian forces at risk of being cut off if Mariupol is conquered and the Russian forces drive north and uh, get Ukrainian uh, forces in the east in a pincer movement. So that's an issue. But I, I did just want to disagree with Angela a little bit on the Russian population. I don't think that if they, even if they knew what was going on, necessarily you'd see a huge shift. I mean, I think a lot of them do know what's going on. I think Russians are pretty skilled from the Soviet times in getting around propaganda if they want to. I think they do believe that this is an existential uh, point of Russian sovereignty, is to have control of Ukraine. I don't think it's going to last forever necessarily, but I think we're going to be, we're a little too over-optimistic if we think, oh, if only the Russians knew what was going on, they would think like us, and they would think that uh, Zelensky is the underdog, and that this is a bad war to fight. Uh, I think when you see the funerals would have come back, 
of, of the soldiers, a lot of Russians are angry, right? They're angry at the West. Uh, and Putin has has inculcated this, and not just Putin, but this is a popular feeling. Uh, it's un unclear what's going to happen a year from now, or five years from now, or ten years from now. But I really do think that we don't want to have that uh, in our minds as necessarily happening. I'm going to let that disagreement between you two rest in the ether, because while we have talked about the military angle on this conflict, I, I do want to move to the potential for peace. The p I was going to say the promise for peace, but there's no promising here. <laughs> And uh, let's put these facts on the record here as we go on to discuss this. Uh, President Zelensky said last Wednesday that peace talks were beginning to, quote, sound more realistic. Yesterday, the U.N. Secretary General said that diplomatic progress is being made, quote, on several key issues and that there is enough on the table to cease hostilities now. And yesterday, a Kremlin spokesperson said there is some kind of process happening. We would like more active and substantial talks and Zelensky repeated late on Monday that he was ready to meet Putin in any format to discuss ending the war. All right, with all of those building blocks in place, Angela, do, we, do you think we have the potential beginnings of a peace process here? Well, I'm afraid I'm very skeptical at the moment that the Russians have any real interest in coming to a negotiated settlement with the Ukrainians. They're holding these peace talks. They've sent a pretty low-level delegation there. I've talked to someone who's quite familiar with the negotiations, and they say there's really not that much going on. Uh, but for the Russians, the reason to do this is, you know, they can prolong the conflict. We can keep thinking, oh, maybe they're going to come to some agreement, and yet they go on, you know, pounding Ukraine. So at the moment, uh, I think it's it's uh, a little unrealistic to think that anyone's making any real progress. On the other hand, you know, Ukraine and President Zelensky, they have said that they do want to negotiate. Uh, they have said, Zelensky has said that Ukraine would be willing to say going forward that it's going to be a neutral country. It's not going to seek NATO membership. On the other hand, it's also said it wants security guarantees from the P5 countries uh, and, and Turkey and Germany and some other countries. It wants these security guarantees. And if you look at what it wants, it looks a little bit like NATO's Article 5, collective uh, defense, uh, without, of course, Ukraine joining NATO. So it's not clear whether it could get that. What the Russians are demanding is, of course, neutrality, but also recognition of Crimea as part of Russia uh, and recognition of the two republics, the DNR and the LNR, as independent entities uh, within Ukraine and the demilitarization of Ukraine. I mean, Zelensky has said they would be willing to say there won't be maybe foreign bases, foreign troops, obviously, in Ukraine, but the demilitarization of Ukraine totally, I think, is a non-starter. So when you look at what the Russians are demanding and what the Ukrainians are offering, the question is, what are the Russians going to be giving up for this? Uh, you know, what the world would say, and, uh, and they're talking about this, they have to remove all of their troops, at least the ones that came in on February 24th. It's not clear about the troops that have been in the Donbass since 2014. They'd have to remove their troops and give these security guarantees to Ukraine. But one has to ask what, you know, how good would these security guarantees be, given that Russia signed the Budapest Memorandum in 1994, guaranteeing Ukraine's territorial integrity and sovereignty as it gave up its nuclear weapons. And of course, they violated that in 2014. So, you know, hopefully there is a chance for some real negotiated settlement. But I think it's it's too early to say that that's possible. Let me pull one other item out of this. And, and Janice, that was, uh, I, I think I heard this right, that Zelensky said on Monday that any potential agreement would have to be passed by a referendum of the Ukrainian people. Yeah. What, what do you think about the advisability of making that commitment? Well, we know a lot about referendum in this country, Steve, and how much progress they always make possible, right? They can really gum up the works. We have a dynamic here, and it's one of the things that we know uh, makes reaching, let's not use the word peace here, because that's off the table. All we're looking at is a ceasefire and some sort of you know negotiated settlement in which the Ukrainian hatred of Russia goes from a boil to a simmer for the foreseeable future after what they've been through. But he, the dynamics uh, are when you think you're losing, you're most willing to come to the table. As soon as you're even mildly encouraged by the dynamics on the battlefield, 
um, you become less willing. So in the earlier stages of this war, what you heard from Zelensky, I will go anywhere, anytime, uh, and negotiate under any conditions. Yesterday, as the battlefield looks just a little better in the short term for the Ukrainians, then comes the added requirement, well, we're going to submit this to a referendum, which is, in fact, upping the ante in all honesty. From Putin's perspective, uh, that demand, as Angela says, rightly so, for demilitarization. Let's just understand what that is. That means no Ukrainian army. There is zero chance of any Ukrainian government, no matter who, agreeing to a condition like that. Contrary to what a lot of people think, I don't think Crimea is the stumbling block here, and probably not even those two provinces. The really critical issues are demilitarization and security guarantees. And I can tell you that is what is being discussed in part at the NATO summit. What kind of meaningful security guarantee are Western powers going to give Ukraine when there is now the live possibility that Putin will stop now or whenever this ends and then go back at it at some future time. That is an entirely different kind of security guarantee. Uh, it's not theoretical. It's entirely imaginable. So these are the really tough issues on both sides of this. What's the best we can hope for right now? A temporary ceasefire? to let the parties negotiate. And in fact, what that would also mean is to let them both restock. This is a rough road ahead. Hmm. So the assumption is therefore, Janice, that if there is a temporary ceasefire to allow some negotiations, you see it as merely a prelude to an inevitable return to, to fighting. No, nothing's, no, it's not inevitable. Okay. And I, I think it's very important that when we talk about negotiations, we not see that as an alternative to fighting. Um, in every conflict that has gone on past a few days, the two things, unfortunately, occur together. You fight and you negotiate at the same time. Um, and that's essentially the mode now that we moved into between Russia and Ukraine. I don't see Putin willing um, to back down. And there's no way Zelensky backs down, frankly, at this time. So it's fight and negotiate for the foreseeable future. And what's really important is that we keep encouraging the negotiation process. Because if, it, if there is no process, the, the asymmetrical damage that I spoke about earlier on continues to be inflicted on Ukraine. Hmm. Jeff, uh, this may be a pedantic question, but how do you hold a meaningful referendum when 10 million of your population <laughs> is in flight and Russian soldiers are occupying two provinces in the Crimea in the east? Yeah, that's a good question, Steve. And I really think that this is Zelensky's fear that he doesn't want to sign any kind of deal that would anger the Ukrainian population. And obviously, as Angela and Janice have said, when both sides think there's a possibility of victory, and when Zelensky has uh, fueled this rhetoric, just, justifiably, I mean, he is a great wartime president, there's no doubt about that, that Ukraine can win, then it becomes very hard to convince the population of very painful uh, negotiations, very painful concessions to Russia, which might include something like demilitarization. And I would agree with Janice that it's not really the, the Crimea or even these, these smaller territories that are now behind Russian control. It's if maybe Russia demands a bigger chunk of territory or this question of demilitarization or this question of somehow gaining security guarantees that are not really going to be guarantees. And so I think that Zelensky is too afraid now to push something where he would have to concede beyond NATO membership in Crimea because he knows the population wouldn't support it. And for both Putin and Zelensky, to have a, a war, a, a conclusion to this war that's seen as victorious is necessary for their survival. Neither of them will survive without winning this war, the war having seemed to be won in the eyes of the population. So therefore, it makes it very difficult. But I would agree that the, the importance of negotiations to have some kind of ceasefire, also to get the civilian populations out, to reduce the number of civilian casualties, that's really something that, that horrifies me now, the, the number of civilians that have been killed in this uh, conflict. Hmm. Angela, I heard the Senate Majority Leader in the States, Mitch McConnell, say the other day that that he thinks Ukraine should keep going because it's winning and can win. 
And I, I, I guess that prompted a question in my head. What does Ukrainian victory look like potentially? Well, I mean, it's hard to see how Ukraine could win again given the overwhelming Russian military superiority over Ukraine, despite all the mistakes that the Russian military has made. I mean, a win for Ukraine, theoretically, would be that the Russian troops would withdraw and say, okay, war is over, you won. But you know that's not going to happen. I mean, Vladimir Putin, as was just said, his survival is dependent now, as is Zelensky's, on, on winning this war. So Russian troops could only withdraw if, and that's difficult to imagine at the moment, if Putin could present this as some kind of a win. So would he be prepared if there were a negotiated agreement, and there are a lot of ifs here, to say, well, Ukraine is neutral and whatever else Zelensky agrees to, you know, we won. Is he, would he be prepared to do that? That's possible. Um, but right now, uh, when you listen to the rhetoric that's coming from him uh, and other people around him, and now Dmitry Medvedev has seems to have a new role as a kind of attack dog, uh, writing all, all of these things, accusing the Ukrainians in the West of, of, of all these uh, terrible things that they're doing. I mean, it seems to me that um, at this point, uh, Putin, you know, would not be willing uh, to, or, you know, to say that, uh, okay, well, we're leaving Ukraine, but we've somehow achieved all of our objectives. And that's why I agree with Janice. I mean, you could have a pause, you can have a ceasefire, everyone can regroup. This could really be a long, a very long conflict uh, that will go on um, uh, for, you know, for months or possibly years to come. Hmm. With just a few minutes to go here, let me uh, put a couple of comments from the Russian dissident and former chess champion Garry Kasparov on the record here. Uh, he tweeted the other day, my belief based on Putin's character and track record is that the greatest risk of nuclear escalation comes from his becoming so intoxicated on impunity that he believes the West will do nothing to stop him from attacking a NATO nation or even using a nuclear weapon. You may say confronting Putin is more likely to cause escalation, but you are arguing against history. Not only Putin's history, but that of every hostile dictator of the past. The greatest danger is the dictator believing that you cannot stop him because you choose not to. Janice, your reaction to that? I see you're shaking your head already. Yeah, disagree. I couldn't disagree more strongly. Um, look, what we've seen happen is um, Vladimir Putin has put a nuclear umbrella over Ukraine. That's why there's no fly zone. Uh, that, that's the fundamental reason there is a no fly zone. And what Biden and European leaders are talking about at the NATO meeting, how close can we come to that line without crossing it and being becoming a combatant? But the other side, so when people ask, has Putin deterred NATO, of course it has. But let's talk about the other side. NATO has put a nuclear umbrella over every NATO country, even those that are up against Russia's borders. And you notice Putin has not been attacking, with one exception, really, along the western border of Ukraine. That's not by accident, even though supply lines are coming over, and those supply lines, frankly, absolutely critical to the survival of Ukraine. So this kind of argument by Gary Kasparov is one of the most dangerous arguments that you can make. One point that is not made often enough, Stevie, if we get this wrong and there is some escalation to any kind of unconventional weapon, the people who suffer most here are the Ukrainians because that's where those weapons will be detonated. That is not a set. That, that whole argument is not sensible nor responsible. Indeed. I want to thank the three of you for joining us on our program tonight and making your contributions so eloquently. Janice Stein from the University of Toronto, Jeff Sahadeo from the Institute of European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies at Carleton University in Ottawa, Angela Stent. Uh, joining us from the nation's capital in the United States. And we remind people her book is called Putin's World, Russia Against the West and With the Rest. Thank you, you three. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. The terrible images coming out of Ukraine show the carnage caused by missiles and guns fired by tanks and dropped from airplanes. 
It's awful, but they are not unfamiliar scenes of conventional war. That's in contrast to what many feared would be a critical part of such a conflict, cyber war. Joining us now on that, in Stanford, California, Jacqueline Schneider, Hoover Fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. In Washington, D.C., Brandon Valeriano, Senior Fellow at the Cato Institute and a Distinguished Senior Fellow at Marine Corps University. And in Kingston, Ontario, Christian Leuprecht, Professor at the Royal Military College of Canada, Director of Queen's University's Institute of Intergovernmental Relations, and co-author of Intelligence as Democratic Statecraft. And we're happy to have all three of you on our program tonight to help us understand this uh, most confusing part about the war in Eastern Europe. And I want to start by just looking at some predictions made at the outset of this war when it comes to cyber attacks and operations within Ukraine. For example, a headline in Politico said, a Russian invasion of Ukraine could redefine cyber warfare. Former White House cyber expert Jason Healy said that it will be the first time a state with real capabilities is willing to take risks and put it all on the line. A report from the RAND Corporation warned of the, quote, massive employment of cyber warfare tools to create shock and awe causing Ukraine's defenses or will to fight to collapse. Let's explore that. Jacqueline, to what extent have any of those things happened? Uh, so none of those things have happened. Um, and I think if you look back at the work that Brandon Valeriano and I and many other scholars within academia have been doing, we actually didn't anticipate that cyber would look like a bomb or that cyber would decrease the will of the Ukrainians to fight. Um, in fact, a lot of the academic research conducted over the last three to five years suggested that the cyber war would play out exactly how it has played out so far. Hmm. Brandon, are we learning that cyber operations actually, apparently, are not all that useful when it comes to the battlefield? Well, yeah, that's something we've thought for quite a bit of time, that they're not really coercive, they're not really useful on the battlefield, that this idea of decisive victory through cyber uh, never really was true, logically, empirically, historically. Christian, why do you think? Tell us your view on why you think things have been so quiet on the cyber front. Yeah, well, it's either the dog that didn't bark or the dog that hasn't barked yet. And so I think there may be also an issue of perhaps the Russians sort of keeping their powder dry. It may be that perhaps we're better prepared than we thought we were. It may be that the Russians just simply aren't as capable uh, as we thought. We may be doing a very good job at suppressing certain of their capabilities. So, for instance, there appears to have been some impact on ransomware by some of these state tolerated um, uh, dark actors in uh, Russia. So it seems that there is um, a significant amount of activity. And so I think it's difficult to tell from the open source evidence how much of this is attributable to what particular types of causes. But I do think perhaps the Russian operatives were caught as unprepared um, as their kinetic counterparts in um, having to operationalize a cyber campaign. And so they just perhaps didn't just have the time to actually pre-position themselves um, and shift from espionage capabilities to uh, subversion or sabotage capabilities at the scale at which would have been necessary uh, on this very short timeline. Jacqueline, does that make sense to you? Yeah, if you don't mind, if I could throw in a little bit of a caveat, because mm. while we didn't see cyber operations looking like a bomb or looking like an aircraft, I think we are seeing cyber operations play out in an important way on the battlefield. Uh, there are reports of hacking into satellite networks that may potentially have had a large impact on Ukrainian abilities to command and control their forces at the beginning of this conflict. And I think as this conflict goes on, we're going to get a better understanding of how the Russians have tried to use cyber more like an intelligence uh, tool or as a sabotage tool to try and create fog, to try and create uncertainty and decrease the ability to command and control. Um, and I think when we look back in the future at puzzles around this conflict and um, why the Russians have had such a difficulty controlling and commanding their own forces, um, why they seem to be always talking on unclassified networks, I think we're going to find that there is a much larger role for cyber operations, but it's going to look a lot more like intelligence and a lot less like 
bombs. And I think that's the overarching lesson um, that states should take from this conflict, is that where cyber matters is how it increases the fog and the uncertainty of conflict and how it changes the information that states have in order to make decisions on the battlefield. We will come back to that. But, uh, Brandon, I wonder if I could get you to follow up on this angle of the thing. If there's one thing that I suspect makes this war very different from previous ones, it's the amount of social media proliferating throughout the conflict. There are people on on all the TikTok, all the formats, all the platforms, all the time, who are bringing us this war in real time, in in granular detail that we may not have seen before. I don't understand why the Russians presumably could, but haven't, used cyber to knock all that capability out. Why do you think they haven't done that? Well, I think that's a very big ask for any organization, even the Russians. And uh, I think perhaps we maybe have overestimated the Russians, particularly in their ability of information operations, because we've talked about active measures and reflection, reflective measures and uh, all these ideas about how good the Russians are, particularly in relation to 2016 and the U.S. election. But it's never been really proven or demonstrated that they've been very effective. And this just shows their continual failures all around on the battlefield in cyber and all aspects of diplomacy. So, Christian, it's not the case that the Russians could, if they wanted to, simply knock out the capability of Ukrainians to upload these messages and send them all over the world? Yeah, I mean, the Russians have also burned a lot of their capabilities because they're so hyperactive in cyberspace. That also gives us good insights into what capabilities they actually have. Uh, and if you think about so offensive operations, that is to say the capability of multiple Western intelligence agencies uh, to peek into um, Russian uh, capabilities and Russian actors, both in terms of capabilities as well as their intent, um, it may have also, there, I think there's at least some evidence here that uh, the West has sort of kept its powder dry and is able to intercept some of this ability by the Russians to operate in sort of uh, with with impunity in this space. I think there's also still a trial and error element here that when it comes to kinetic warfare, we have a pretty good idea of how deterrence, intelligence sort of interact and how we use those. Whereas in the cyberspace, I think everybody's still kind of figuring out what exactly the dynamics are at play, as well as the potential overlaps between the cyberspace space and the kinetic space. So I think it's sort of an, a, a rapidly evolving um, domain of, of warfare in itself, as well as the multi-domain implications here that everybody is kind of watching with bated breath here. Brandon, let me follow up with you on that, because uh, cyber was apparently used uh, to great skill by Russia uh, seven, eight years ago when they took over Crimea. Is it possible that Ukraine you learned a lot of lessons from that experience and is successfully beating back Russia's attempt to use cyber in this conflict? Well, I wouldn't say the Russians have been very skillful. They've been very active, but there's a big difference between being very active and being very skillful. But uh, yeah, Erica Bogard, uh, Erica Longerin and I wrote a article recently uh, looking at the U.S. defensive operations. And this is part of the U.S. strategy to defend forward, to collaborate with partners and allies to support their efforts to fend off attacks. And that's exactly what's happened. And that's exactly what the United States doctrine has been. And I think the challenge is this idea of combined arms, joint warfare with cyber. That's not even on offer in the U.S. military, let alone in the Russian military. So I think a lot of people have jumped the gun in terms of what they view as a revolutionary change in warfare when we're just not quite there yet. Jacqueline, can I get you to weigh in on that issue of whether they have been active but not skillful? Yeah, I mean, I think once again, we're going to have a lot of it's going to be a lot of time before we get what we would call the battle damage assessment to understand how cyber operations truly affected the battlefield. But the reality is the Russians have not been able to coordinate land and air campaigns, which is a com form of combined warfare that goes back to, you know, World War II, where it really kind of revolutionized in the 90s. So the inability to then also integrate cyber operations shouldn't be completely unexpected. Um, and then when it comes to information campaigns, I think we need to realize that where the Russians have been most successful is when they're able to play on existing schisms within society. So why were they so successful in 2016? Because the U.S. had existing schisms, and they were able to build personas and information campaigns that simply amplified divisions that already existed within society. They weren't able to do that against NATO and the West because 
there wasn't a real schism about who was the bad guy here. Uh, I think they seriously underestimated their ability to uh, deceive. Um, I think they underestimated the strength of the Ukrainian forces um, and the Ukrainian ability to control the narrative. Um, but you will see, I wouldn't say the Russians are, are all out on information operations. Um, while we don't see a lot of successful Russian information operation campaigns about Ukraine targeted at the West, uh, we are seeing that they are using their efforts to target countries that may be on the fence, uh, China, uh, Brazil, India. Uh, so that's something that we're going to see play out and see whether they're able to control that narrative. We also have to remember that this is a manpower intensive uh, kind of, of operation. So we, we think about cyber as high technology, but it's all about high people. Um, and so you have to imagine that the Russians are having to use a lot of their people for information campaigns uh, directed at their own people, um, because probably the primary threat to Putin at this point is an internal threat. All right. Notwithstanding everything everybody has said so far, let's consider whether there may be pending attacks on critical infrastructure. And to that end, President Biden did say earlier this week that the U.S. has, quote, evolving intelligence that the Russian government is exploring options for potential cyber attacks against the United States. Christian, let me bring you in on this. Um, a lot of our critical infrastructure in Canada, as in the United States, is owned and operated by private companies. Do you think they are preparing? Are they adequately prepared for a Russian cyber attack at the moment? Well, I think we've got, come a long way in this country. The Canadian Center for Cybersecurity and its ability to coordinate, especially with uh, larger companies, the Canadian Cyber Threat Exchange uh, that affords uh, many of the largest entities in Canada so of almost real-time capabilities to understand the threat environment, the ability, of course, to coordinate in terms of the international security pyramid with the United States at the top and the five eyes countries below that, Canada, the UK, Australia, uh, and New Zealand. Zealand, both in terms of the information and intelligence exchange, but also learning from one another of how you coordinate effectively um, with, uh, with your private sector here. And I think the private-public sector collaboration is really one of the big emerging stories of this conflict. If you look at, for instance, the way uh, the Viper uh, capability uh, in, in, in the Ukrainian networks was detected, uh, as well as the ability here to coordinate with the private sector, because, of course, the bulk of that critical infrastructure is is owned by the private sector and does not controlled by government, uh, but government plays a critical role because it has um, a disproportionate capability uh, in terms of the domain awareness and the intelligence that it can gather. It also has, of course, offensive capabilities that can, for instance, attempt to deny certain activities by an adversary that the private sector cannot. And so I think trying to figure out what exactly uh, this interaction looks like, it seems that so far, We've been reasonably successful, but of course, the solar winds attacks in the United States uh, was a uh, clear warning that the Russians do have extremely sophisticated capabilities to drill very far into servers and networks, and to do that in an undetected way uh, that could go well beyond espionage and could involve potentially significant sabotage capabilities. Well, Brandon, let's let's keep going here anyway. As you imagine what a potential Russian cyber attack against the United States could look like, what do you see? There are a lot of targets, and I got to say we've gotten a lot better, but we also need to do better. And I think one of the messages that uh, has been going out with the U.S. government is that we need to harden targets. And that's something a lot of people have been saying for a long time, particularly the Solarium uh, Commission looking at cyberspace uh, strategy is that we need to think about layered deterrence. We need to think about defense in depth, and we just haven't really done that before. And this, uh, you know, this is really one of the true uh, first visions of real public-private cooperation. And hopefully this will be the way we move forward into the future, but uh, we'll see given other types of attacks and other types of uh, uh, foreign policy crises that develop over time. But uh, we we've known for a long time that, uh, particularly in my data uh, on cyber incidents, we've seen that uh, the 
Russians have attacked the Americans uh, 47 times over the last 20 years. They basically average three a year. Uh, we're, we're actually, in fact, due. And it's strange that we haven't seen anything during this war. Um, but uh, this does demonstrate a remarkable amount of restraint by the Russians, which is strange given that they have no restraint in all other aspects of warfare. So you have to wonder either does cyber, are they not that good at it? Is cyber not what really going to be an effective method for them? Or are they really fearful of the idea of mutually assured destruction in cyberspace? Uh, you know, we're not sure at this point. Well, that's what I was wondering. Deterrence may be working here. And Jackie, let me put this to you, because President Biden did warn, quote, if Russia pursues cyber attacks against our companies, our critical infrastructure, we're prepared to respond. Conversely, what would a cyber response against Russia look like in your eyes? Yeah, this is a real challenge for the Biden administration. They've never articulated what cyber punishments would look like. Um, and in the past, what we've seen out of the U.S. government is that the response to cyber operations has generally been sanctions, um, diplomacy, um, DOJ, that's our Department of Justice, warrants out for hackers' arrest. Well, all of this kind of group of possibilities have already been used against Russia. Um, so we don't have a lot of these, what we call lower threshold activities to threaten Russia with at this point. And the Biden administration has stopped short of saying what they would do if a big cyber attack were to happen against the United States. I think this is actually somewhere where the Biden administration might benefit from giving a little bit of detail about what they would be willing to do. Now, my research and Brandon's as well suggests that it's actually very difficult to get the U.S. public interested in retaliating to a cyber attack, um, especially with conventional force. Um, but there's a potential that if this was a large enough cyber attack, um, that we could credibly punish or credibly threaten punishment with the conventional capabilities. Um, and I think that's something that the Biden administration probably is thinking about and talking about, um, but it would have to be a very, very large scale cyber attack. I think in general, the answer to cyber attacks and the answer to de deterring them is being more resilient. If a state like Russia can't create a large response, then what's the point of taking the attack in the first place? So investments in defense, investments in network resilience, and then I think there should be a public education campaign. So instead of telling the American public or the Canadian public that, hey, these cyber attacks are coming and they're scary, we say cyber attacks are going to happen. They happen every single day. But they generally do not create physical effects, and they generally don't create long-term effects. So we as the government are going to help you uh, weather the economic cost of these cyber attacks. And what we ask you to do is keep calm, um, because the primary response that creates effects is panic. And um, so if you can keep panic down, I think actually we're set up pretty well to withstand a series of different cyber attacks. Well, Christian, I wonder if it's different in as much as, listen, for, I mean, you're, you're in, a, in, a, in a line of work where you play out scenarios for a living. So I, everybody understands that if there's an attack, and I guess everybody infers that to be a conventional attack against a NATO country, it's one for all and all for one. Would, would a cyber attack warrant the same response? In other words, a Russian cyber attack against the United States or any other NATO member, does that trigger Article 5 and, and we're at war? Well, that'll ultimately be a conversation for the Atlantic Council when they decide, when the political leadership decides whether whatever might have transpired uh, might warrant calling in Article 5. Um, but I think that's a relevant uh, conversation because uh, of many of our allies are perhaps not quite as resilient as we ourselves are. And so this is, of course, why the U.S. has invested and other countries, including Canada, has invested so heavily in making sure you bring other partners up to speed, why we use multilateral fora, both NATO and the European 
European Union uh, to ensure that uh, uh, allies and partners are more robust. But so it's it's the potentials of an attack on an ally, but it's those spillover effects from an attack. So you turn out the lights somewhere, and for instance, there's uh, some say U.S. soldiers or so in a hospital somewhere that are on life support for just in a regular hospital, um, and they end up dying. Um, is that loss of life might then sort of that uh, that constitute an attack? So I think this is one of the big concerns that it's very difficult to calibrate these attacks and and not uh, to un there's a lot of unintended consequences that can come with these. And we saw this with the NotPetya attack, of course, in in 2017 in Ukraine that sort of spilled over globally. And uh, that may, on the one hand, have a deterrence effect on Russia, but on the other hand, uh, that's perhaps one of the greatest liabilities that we face within the alliance. Well, Brandon, let me put that to you because, uh, well, Jens Stoltenberg, the NATO Secretary General, has said in the past that a cyber attack against a NATO member can trigger the collective defense clause of the Atlantic Alliance. So I wonder what level of concern do you have right now that a misguided cyber attack by one against somebody else could trigger World War III? Well, that's really going to be a question for the members of NATO, and they're going to have to decide by unanimous vote here. And uh, clearly, the Baltic states and Poland and other states would push for Article 5 to be invoked, but it's not clear that the other states would, and it's not clear that there could be an impact. Uh, a lot of these hypotheticals don't really make a lot of sense in reality, like the idea of a hospital attack and attack on power. Hospitals have backup generators. They have uh, backup facilities. A lot of these things that happen that go wrong are often uh, the fault of the defender by not being prepared. So, so like Jackie said, we need to focus on resilience. We need to focus on survival. We need to focus on defense first and then figure out how to respond if the worst case happens. But often the worst case in our minds doesn't really meet with reality. And we often inflate the threat that the Russians provide. And that is a very large problem for U.S. and Canadian defense because we might be reacting in the wrong way to the perception of a fear or a threat and not really focusing on the things that we can do to prevent the attacks in the first place. Christian, do you think I think all the parties involved understand that a cyber attack could have the same unanticipated, incalculable damages uh, as a conventional attack would, and we could be in the middle of a third world war. I think everybody on both sides is uh, is very much trying to avoid getting themselves into that sort of a scenario uh, where you have an escalation ladder that neither side then is able to control. And we would also hope that just as there are military to military capabilities to talk to one another when it comes to nuclear weapons, that there are other signaling capabilities with the Russians uh, that we have in place to try to avoid that escalation. One of the, I guess, in quotation marks, benefits with uh, in 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 an uh, advocacy serial situation with Russia is that, of course, we have decades of experience on both the Russian as well as the U.S. and the NATO side in terms of interacting and trying to avoid things from getting completely out of hand with various protocols and so forth. The challenge in cyberspace is we don't really have these types of de-escalation uh, protocols in place, but we can hopefully try to rely on that experience uh, to try to avoid uh, that sort of brinkmanship. But of course, the challenge is, regardless of what the uniforms might want to say, um, if you have a political leadership that finds itself cornered, it might possibly resort to measures uh, that could have very deleterious consequences uh, for uh, countries, including uh, members of the alliance. Well, this may be a silly follow-up, but Jacqueline, we knew that during the Cold War, there was a hotline between Moscow and Washington to ensure that if the awful, awful happened, at least people could get on the phone and, 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 and confirm, you know, are, are we under attack or are we not? If there's a cyber attack, presumably the bat phone doesn't work anymore. Uh, how do we negotiate around all that? Well, I don't think a cyber attack is going to take out the bat phone, <laughs> and partly because it was built to be resilient, um, and also because it's generally on a separate network, which means uh, both states are not going to want to destroy that. Um, I've done a lot of research on the impact that cyber operations have on nuclear stability. I ran a series of war games with my colleagues at the Naval War College for over three years with 580 players from all over the world. Uh, and I went into it very worried that cyber operations were going to create instability dynamics, where it would create fear and concern and lead to preemptive nuclear use. The, the good story is, in these, you know, with 580 players, we never saw a link between fear of cyber attacks and preemptive nuclear use. This is good. 
Um, but what we did see were uh, incentives for accidental and inadvertent escalation. So what does that look like? Uh, on one hand, uh, for folks that have cyber capabilities, we found that they're generally overconfident with cyber capabilities. So if a state like Russia or the United States thinks it can take out a nuclear command and control, they may be uh, incentivized to use this type of cyber attack early in a conflict because it feels less escalatory. Well, that in itself might not lead to escalation. The concern, however, is that that leads to accidents. And that's actually where we see the largest effect of cyber operations, is in creating um, uh, confusion and creating accidental responses. Um, and that's the concern with how cyber operations might affect nuclear stability. The other concern is that if a state really thinks they're vulnerable, that they will pre-delegate decisions to launch nuclear weapons to a lower level, or automate that decision making. Now, we have no indication that either the United States or Russia is moving in that direction. Um, but I think it would be worthwhile for the states to have a communication about how this could trigger accidental escalation. Um, but I am not concerned about preemptive escalation. And I'm actually, the phenomenal empirical puzzle that I find in my work is how little reaction cyber operations create. It's not that people are scared of a hospital attack and so they overreact. It's actually that they don't even do the basic uh, authentication that, and password procedures you need for basic cyber defense. Um, so the, the concern really is that cyber operations lead people to be complacent um, and that accidents occur when they should not have occurred. Um, but my concern is not that it will, I actually am not worried that it's going to trigger, art, trigger Article 5. I'm more worried <laughs> that um, errant bombs and uh, air defenses and uh, shooting down aircraft, I'm more worried that that could trigger, trigger Article 5. Hmm. That sounds like a somewhat hopeful note to leave this on, so maybe I should take that and run with it. I want to thank our three guests for appearing on TVO tonight. Jacqueline Schneider in Stanford, California. Uh, Christian Leuprecht in Kingston, Ontario. Brandon Valeriano in Washington, D.C. Good of all of you to join us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That is the agenda for Wednesday, March 23rd, 2022. As a new COVID strain gains steam, tomorrow we'll assess whether it has the potential to be as disruptive as Omicron was. Also, we'll find out more about emerging vaccine technology. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.